Hello everybody and welcome to the latest Asian Carp Canada webinar. My name is Rebecca Schroeder and I work on the Asian Carp program at the Invasive Species Centre and I will be your moderator today. So for today's webinar we're switching things up a bit and instead of focusing on Asian Carps we will be focusing on tench. But before we get started there are a couple of things I wanted to mention. First there will be time for questions following the webinar. So if at any point you have a question please type it in the question box and I will read it to our speaker after the webinar. Second, if you are having any issues during the webinar, you can write them in the chat box and we will try to resolve it for you, or you can send me an email. Lastly, there will be a brief survey at the end of the webinar. If you could take a few minutes to fill it out, that would be greatly appreciated and it would really help us out. So today's webinar is titled, On the Doorstep of the Great Lakes, Tench. What is it? How did it get here? And what now? And I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Sunchi Alvliash. Sunchi is a PhD candidate in the Ricciardi lab at McGill University. Her current work is concerned with improving our ability to predict where invasive fishes will have a high impact and where they are less likely to create a disturbance. For much of this work, Sunchi has used the Eurasian tench as a model because it has successful invasion po invasive populations on every continent except Antarctica. Yet on a more local scale, it has failed to establish in many watersheds where it was purposely stocked. Her project to identify habitats preferred by tench has led her to field sites in the St. Lawrence River and Lake Champlain close to her home base in Montreal, to the Pendorai River in Washington State, and the Breed River in South Africa. She complements her field research with lab experiments that examine how impacts of the fish change across different environments. And with that, I will pass things over to Sunchi to talk to us about tench. Hi everyone. I'm really glad to be here to be able to tell you a little bit about this fish that I've been studying since 2014 when I started my PhD at McGill University under the supervision of uh, Anthony Ricciardi and Nicholas Mandrat. So meet the tench. Um, the tench is a fish from Eurasia. It grows quite large. The maximum reported si uh, size is around 70 centimeters. That's about 28 inches. Although the ones that we catch in uh, the St. Lawrence uh, right now are mostly between 30 and 40 centimeters and occasionally we catch a, a large one that uh, goes just a bit over 50 centimeters just a bit over half a meter similar to the one you're seeing here the maximum weight uh, of course of that 70 centimeter one is somewhere around six kilograms most of the ones we catch are one to two kilos and this fish uh, has quite a long lifespan it can live up to 20 years it starts reproducing when it's uh, anywhere between one and three years old. It, it depends on uh, the environmental conditions where it's um, living, how early it'll start spawning. But once it does reach maturity, it can spawn uh, many times during a season if the temperature is warm enough. And every time it spawns, it lays hundreds of thousands of eggs per kilo of fish. So that's that's the new fish that has arrived that is entering the Great Lakes. And it has come from uh, Eurasia and it has a really long history of introductions across the globe. They go back to 100 years ago. So all those areas in yellow you see on the map are watersheds where tench have native uh, populations. And then the areas in red are uh, watersheds where there is at least one established uh, population of introduced tench and you can see that it's been really introduced to every continent except Antarctica um, and although it has this really broad global distribution when we look a little bit closer we see that it actually has a pretty high failure rate also so um, the interesting history about this fish in North America is that in the late 1800s, the U.S. Fisheries Commission attempted to stock it in many, many um, areas all across the country. And all of those yellow squares represent uh, attempts at stocking tench that failed where tench actually is no longer found today. The red dots, of course, represent um, established populations. and um, what I found really interesting is that this like vast difference between successes and failures, because at some of those sites where they are established, 
pench are very successful. So for example, on the West Coast, we went and we sampled the Pendere River, which is a tributary to the Columbia River in Washington State. And we were just pulling out nets that were chock full of pench. It was by far the most abundant fish in the river. So that should give us a sign that we shouldn't be complacent um, by all the failures, especially uh, because it is arriving in the Great Lakes. Uh, but first, I just want to tell you a little bit about why tench were stocked. Like, why were they brought to all these different places? And one of the reasons is that while it's not as popular a food fish like trout, not as many people like to eat it, it was a really easy fish to move around. So it survived transport really well. So people were able to pop them in some barrels and put them on a train and ship them to India or put them on a ship and bring them to North America or South Africa or Australia. So a lot of these sto the stocking happened a hundred years ago. Um, and one of the reasons was uh, also that tench were readily available because there's a really long history of culturing tench in ponds in Europe and they're really easy to keep and they survive really well and it requires minimum, minimal input from um, someone who wants to culture them. So on the right, you see a little pamphlet or the title page of a little pamphlet from the 1500s uh, giving advice about how to culture fish, including tench in ponds. And even today, um, tench are readily available for sale, um, for example, in the UK, but also other European countries. Uh, tench are also a very popular fish among anglers, especially coarse fish anglers. So the people who like fishing for carp um, are often really excited to get to fish for tench as well. And in some places, um, tench is eaten for food, uh, particularly uh, there are a few locales around northern Italy where tench is actually a specialty. So for those reasons, people thought it would be a good idea to introduce them uh, about 100 years ago. But why are they coming to the Great Lakes now? Because of course, the first and only fish in the Great Lakes so far has been found uh, two, less than two years ago in Bay of Quinty. Well, this introduction is a lot more recent. and it actually came from Quebec. So um, there was a farmer who lived in St. Alexandre in Quebec, uh, very close to the Richelieu River. And he had heard about how easy it is to keep tench and how in some places people eat it. And he had these ponds on his property and he thought it would be a good idea to start um, commercial business um, and he wanted to import tench. Now, his application for uh, permits from the Quebec government was denied, but um, he decided to go over to Germany anyway, and it was the 80s, and he brought back about 30 small tench in a picnic cooler on a commercial flight, um, somehow made it through customs, and came home and dumped those fish in his ponds where the fish did uh, extremely well, I guess, and they reproduced. And so he had a whole bunch of tench on his property. But uh, the business aspect of this wasn't going as well because, of course, there's no market for tench in North America, really. And uh, also the Quebec government was quite angry with him because he had been told he wasn't supposed to do this, but he did it anyways. And so he was, it was turning into a bit of a headache for him, I guess. And he decided to shut things down uh, in terms of the tench operation, and he drained his ponds. Um, unfortunately, the draining of the ponds also coincided with a year where there was a flooding event, and the tench were able to swim through that agricultural runoff uh, into the Richelieu River. And in 1991, they were first reported in the Richelieu River, uh, or rather, they were reported a few years later, but uh, when the Quebec government spoke with the commercial fishers in the area, they uh, reported that they had been catching that fish since at least 91. So we estimate that the year that they entered the uh, river, it was around 91. Um, the Richelieu River connects uh, Lake Champlain, that's down in New York and Vermont, to the St. Lawrence River, so it flows um, 
from Lake Champlain up into the St. Lawrence and then uh, swam upstream towards Lake Champlain, uh, where they were first detected in 2002. Um, and now they're today they're found throughout the entire lake, all the way to the southern part of the lake. Uh, of course, they also swam downstream. And in 2006, they were first detected in the St. Lawrence River in that uh, lake-like area of the St. Lawrence River. It's called Lake St. Pierre. That's just downstream of Montreal. Uh, lake St. Pierre is also really good habitat for tench. As you'll see, I'll talk a little bit uh, later, a little bit more about the tench preferred habitat. But Lake St. Pierre is full of wetlands and nice habitat where tench um, uh, have everything they need to reproduce and survive. And then from Lake St. Pierre, probably from that uh, densely established population, uh, they started making their way upstream uh, towards Montreal and then past Montreal to that other area that's Lake Lake in the St. Lawrence called, that we call Lake St. Francis, uh, where they were first found in 2016. That was also the first year that they were found um, in Ontario. And then, of course, only a couple of years later, they made that big jump um, and we found them in Bay of Quinty. So it's still pretty early days. They're really at the doorstep of the Great Lakes and they haven't uh, quite established that dense populations yet. But, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, one thing that uh, we really uh, wanted to look into was how are they getting around? Um, why are we finding them um, like spreading throughout the uh, river? And um, they're not normally thought of as a fish that normally moves around a lot. Usually they hang around one area where they feed. Um, and they're not really thought of as a fish that swims really long distances. But some telemetry studies, uh, those are studies where you put a tag on a fish and then you follow around to see of far it travels. Um, so some of these studies have shown that tench actually will travel really long distances, even um, though they, they wouldn't normally, but when the habitat is uh, less than ideal or things get too crowded, uh, tench are able to move fairly long distances in search of better habitat. And so there was a study that was done that showed this in France, but also recently uh, fisheries and oceans and Quebec has been doing a telemetry study and from their early like preliminary data we have uh, been seeing that the fish in our river are also moving quite a bit right now so they could be moving through natural natural spread uh, which is quite surprising especially because we have a number of natural and artificial barriers so there are the rapids uh, south of Montreal that we wouldn't have thought Tench can go through. Of course, Tench have other path, pathways through the Chine Canal or up between Laval and Montreal that they can pass through, but those areas also have dams and locks. So it seems that Tench may have the ability to swim through those dams and locks. Um, and although they have this ability, those dams and locks also still um, represent an opportunity uh, to stop tench from moving if we add some additional barriers, similar to the barriers that are being considered for the Asian carps, to help the Asian carp spread, like uh, walls of bubbles or strobe lights or noise. None of these things have actually been tested for tench yet, but they're definitely an opportunity and, and a possible way of halting uh, the spread if they are spreading naturally. Another possibility is that we're kind of giving them a hand by letting them hitchhike across uh, these barriers. So uh, one possible uh, pathway could be that they're moving um, with the commercial fishery transport. So we do know that fishes from the Richelieu River uh, that are ca captured by the commercial fishers there um, include a lot of tench bycatch. And although the tench is not targeted to be sold at the market, um, sometimes it, they just get mixed in with the bycatch. And we do know that those fish are sent to Toronto markets. And we do know that tench survive quite a long time outside of water, as long as they're in moist conditions. And one of the things that 
raises suspicion about this being a pathway is that the 2016 tench capture in Lake St. Francis was in very close proximity to a fish holding facility um, that holds fish that are en route to the Toronto market. So it is possible that there may have been somehow an escape of a tench from there. Of course, people have also intentionally moved them, uh, intentionally and without, without authorization. We know of at least one example that has been reported um, near Orangeville in Ontario, where that red dot is. There was uh, another farm pond uh, that was reported to contain tench. Uh, some new uh, property owners purchased the property and they found this fish and they reported it to the province. And of course, it was tench, and of course, the province acted and they removed all of the fish from that pond. That's that tiny pond right there. Um, and when they removed all the fish and we tallied them up, there were almost a thousand tench in that tiny little pond. And so, of course, there is the possibility that these ponds kind of ask, act like inoculation sites where tench become really, really dense. And then, just like we saw in Quebec, they may escape into the natural watersheds or be brought from there again by people. So, that is very alarming. Uh, there could be many more uh, ponds. Uh, where tench may have been introduced, but where they're just not being reported, partly because people don't know what tench are, um, or they don't know what fish they have in their ponds, or you know they just don't know to re to report it because they don't uh, think it's important. Another uh, possibility um, that I think needs a lot of attention are the um, commercial, uh, no, the non-commercial, the recreational fishers, so anglers, who um, might be catching tench. So coarse fishing is not really popular in Canada the way that it is in Europe. But there are, for sure, at least a small community of coarse anglers in Canada. This photo uh, was posted on a message board, and it was somebody who captured a tench very close to Montreal and was very excited to have captured it. And there were a number of other people on the message board who were equally excited that there were tench in the area and including people who were really keen to plan a trip around catching uh, the tench. And uh, we were actually hoping that like tench would get closer to them so they could go fishing for it, I guess, closer to home. And in fact, that person next year went and uh, targeted tench and caught a couple tench and people were very excited. So with the increase in popularity um, of anglers targeting this fish, we really need to make sure that people are educated and that they are not um, going to pick it up and maybe spread it to a new area. Um, because again, tench are really easy to transport. They survive and transport quite well. Um, so yes, so we see uh, people are even starting to report uh, records, uh, fish that they've captured. This one is from Quebec. It's the only record that's been uh, reported so far, but it's from 2018. So it's possible that other people may want to like try to beat that record. And so um, we don't actually need to have an enormous uh, angling community targeting tench. It just takes a few people, like we saw with that single farmer that introduced the population into the St. Lawrence. So one of the things that we're interested in uh, with invaders in general is identifying what habitat requirements it has. What are the things that it's going to uh, create a good condition for it to establish and then reproduce and thrive? And all of these things will determine whether the fish becomes a problem or whether it does not establish at all. So uh, one of the little superpowers that Tench has is it's really, really broad tolerance to low oxygen conditions. It, as I mentioned a couple of times now, it survives really well even when oxygen is really low. It does really well when temperatures are high. Um, it has a higher temperature preference than a lot of our native fishes. So it will hang out in those uh, near shore areas uh, 
that have nice wetland habitat that uh, have shallower water that might get a bit warmer. And so they will hang out there even when other fish will seek cooler waters uh, during heat waves. Um, so that is what uh, really concerns us because that is what will allow it to uh, continue to feed and be a good competitor that may cause problems for native fishes, but it, it's also what allows it to survive in transport and what poses such great risks to uh, new introductions and um, it causes um, concern for um, intentional and accidental introductions of tench by people who might be using it as a bait fish or who might not know what it is and who might be moving it around. In terms of, uh, so it also has a really broad pH uh, tolerance, uh, so that's unlikely to pose any problems for tench in terms of habitat restrictions. Uh, the two uh, aspects that do seem to limit tench are flow. They don't really like really high flow, although we've seen they may be able to move uh, through it, but it's not really an area where they will enjoy hanging out and feeding and uh, reproducing. And they absolutely need submerged um, aquatic vegetation in order to reproduce because the way they spawn is they release their eggs and the eggs uh, stick to vegetation. And so an area that doesn't have wetland is not going to be a good area for them to reproduce in. So we may still find tench in a non-vegetated area, but they certainly will not establish a very successful dense population there. So tench habitat uh, mostly will look something like this. This is a site where um, if tench are around and they're able to establish, they're very likely to establish a high uh, density population. It doesn't mean that we won't find tench in uh, you know, rocky habitat with no vegetation but we're more likely to find very few uh, compared to a tench favorable habitat, such as nice um, near shore wetland areas. We have been doing a study of stomach contents of tench to figure out what it eats so that we can see which fish it may be a competitor for. And what we found is that they primarily feed on snails, but also zebra mussels, and that's uh, probably to be expected if we look at the tench teeth, which they have these big, uh, what are called pharyngeal teeth that are used for crushing shells. And so most of their diet is composed by these um, animals that live in shells. Although they do also eat um, some crustaceans like amphipods or clodocerans and um, some insect larvae. Uh, and the way they feed is, um, if they see the shell, they will go and they will, um, as long as the shell can fit in their mouth, they will just grab the entire shell and then crush it. And then um, the other uh, organisms, the, the smaller ones that live in the sediments, um, mostly they capture those by taking mouthfuls of sediment and then spitting out anything that isn't food. They also have barbels would allow it, which allow them to sense um, where there is food, and um, they're pretty much limited by uh, size of um, shell that they can put in their mouth. So bigger fish, of course, can feed on larger shells, and smaller fish will feed on smaller uh, snails. When we looked at uh, this long history of invasion of tench, we try to identify studies that assess their impacts in those areas, um, but those uh, are actually really challenging to do because tench were usually not introduced alone. They were always introduced with uh, either carp or some other invaders. So it's really difficult to disentangle what the effect of tench is and what is the effect of a different invader. But um, what we did find in the literature are a number of different impacts that have been reported um, and they vary across the invaded range. So in Quebec, uh, we know that they introduced, they, they were found with um, a number of parasites, or at least two, that were not found in, in the St. Lawrence previously, so it's possible that they introduced uh, the parasites into the system. We know tench also um, do get uh, spring baramias, which affects uh, other minnow species, 
so they could act as a reservoir and to amplify uh, the rates of that infection. Uh, can also feed on uh, snails and uh, other mollusks, which could um, cause problems through competition for other native fishes. Um, and some experiments in Europe have shown that where they there are a lot of tench and they're able to really deplete the snail population, they actually uh, have caused a reduction in the submerged aquatic vegetation because the snails normally graze on a periphyton which grows, um, which would normally choke out that aquatic vegetation. And so when there are, while there are snails to keep the periphyton down, the aquatic vegetation does well. And then when you reduce the snail population, that periphyton takes over and you see a reduction in aquatic vegetation. Um, there are a number of reports also of tench uh, opportunistically feeding on other fish eggs. So that could also cause some problems for fish recruitment. And because of their habit to take in mouthfuls of soft sediments and then spit it back out um, in search of prey that may be in the sediment, tench also increase um, the amount of suspended sediment in the water column that reduces the water clarity of the site. Of course, impact is um, correlated with the abundance of the invader. So at a site where we only have a few tench, we're going to see uh, a much lower impact. You're going to, of course, consume fewer snails than at a site where we have just tons and tons of tench where they might deplete the prey. And so we're very interested in seeing and identifying which sites tench will be very abundant in. Um, for example, in Lake St. Pierre, that's that um, lake lake area of the St. Lawrence uh, that I mentioned has really good habitat. We have seen a really concerning explosion in the abundance of tench. So in 2007, 2008, um, no tench were captured in this particular monitoring program. In 2009, a few were captured. And then only five years later, um, in 2014, we were catching, or the monitoring uh, program reported catching thousands of tench. In, the, in Lake St. Francis, of course, to date, we have only caught a handful of tench. But if we see what's happened in Lake St. Pierre and we take that as a warning, um, we should be concerned about something similar happening in Lake St. Francis or even Bay of Quinty. So, Tench, uh, as I discussed, uh, may have an effect on fish that they uh, share a diet overlap with, so other fish that feed on the same things. And as it happens, unfortunately, uh, the copper red horse is uh, mostly living and spawning in the Richelieu River where tench are quite dense. And copper red horse happen to, happens to have a very similar diet to uh, the tench. And one of the reasons we really care about copper red horse is it's listed as endangered and it's also only found in Quebec. So if that population disappears, it will go extinct globally. There are also concerns about the yellow perch uh, population in Lake St. Pierre. The fishery has been closed for many years because there is a lack of recruitment. There is not um, there, there is some kind of problem with their reproduction. The juveniles are not growing um, into adults, and so an added pressure by this really dense tench population may be affecting the yellow perch population in Lake St. Pierre. Um, and a similar situation could also happen in Bay of Quinty. Now, in the Richelieu River, I mentioned there are a handful of commercial fishers, and we don't know if the tench is actually causing a decrease in pumpkin and seed and brown bullhead populations, which are the fishes that these um, commercial fishers target. But we do know that the commercial fishers are having a much harder time capturing these fish because their nets are just so chock full with the invader. So. The ways that uh, this invasion could be managed, or the things that we need to do to manage this invasion is first of all, continue uh, to monitor and report uh, the spread of this species, and also to start planning for some 
rapid responses. And I know that um, both Fisheries and Oceans and uh, the provinces, uh, MNRF and MFFP have been, uh, we have been, have been meeting, they've invited us to attend meetings to uh, give them early results from our research. And I know that they have been discussing and trying to make plans uh, for some rapid responses. There was a meeting just last week um, one of the things uh, that should be the biggest uh, target now is to reduce the spread. So, like I said, targeting some of those existing barriers like locks or natural uh, barriers to spread that don't seem to actually be stopping tension from spreading at the moment, but they could be reinforced um, to prevent their spread. And also reducing the abundance of densely populated sites like Lake St. Pierre may stop or reduce the number of pens that are actually leading that site to look for uh, new habitats. Of course, the enforcement of existing federal, state, and provincial, provincial regulations is important because even where we have regulation against it, um, if it's not enforced, it's not going to stop uh, people from moving the tench. And of course, there are still some gaps in uh, regulation um, to prohibit its possession and sale at least sale of live fish. Uh, what I think is the most important aspect of this is public education. A lot of people have not even heard about tench. They don't know how to identify it. Um, they don't know um, the risks uh, of moving it to new areas and what the potential consequences could be, and particularly public education targeting commercial fishers, anglers, and farmers would be really important. Um, but also just increasing public outreach about this fish, I think is going to be really important because we can do all these other things with fishing down the population and uh, creating these really expensive barriers to natural spread. But if someone's picking them up and then dumping them with a bucket, it's all um, just a big waste of money, especially given how easy it is to move tench um, long distances. So. Uh, some of the monitoring that can be done, and this is similar to the work that we have been doing, is by catching uh, tench with gill nets or seining, which is really good at capturing juveniles, which is sometimes the first fish you see at a site where there are really low abundances. You can also set overnight fike nets, which are similar to what the commercial fishers set. And then, of course, electrofishing has been really good at detecting tench where um, they are at low densities. Uh, but in addition to all of these, what has been really valuable are reports from the public and commercial fishers, all of the initial detections of uh, tench in uh, new areas have been reported by commercial fishers actually, not by our monitoring programs. And so I would encourage anyone who does go fishing and who might start catching more tench, particularly in Ontario or the New York, side where tench are uh, still kind of at the invasion front and they're not as established as they are in, in the Quebec portion of the St. Lawrence or in Lake Champlain in Vermont, I would encourage people to really report them because it's really important for um, managers to know where the invasion front and it is and how rapidly the population is, might be increasing. So to that end, I am just gonna spend the last couple slides telling you a little bit about how to identify tench. Of course, after having worked with it for a number of years, to me, it just looks so different than everything else in our waters. Um, but some identifying features are, it has these really small scales, much smaller than uh, carp. It has very rounded fins, and it only has one dorsal fin. Um, similar to our native minnows, except the native minnows are generally really small and you won't find many, there's like one native minnow that grows um, larger. So um, if it has one dorsal fin, uh, it is likely, in small scales, it's likely a tench. It also has this really characteristic olive green color, um, a single pair of variables, uh, common carp, for example, has really large scales and two pairs of barbels. It is also pretty slimy, um, a lot slimier than carp. Um, of course, there are other fishes that are slimy and 
in our in the Great Lakes Basin, like pike and walleye, but they look very different. Um, and it does have this orange eye, but I, I started the characteristics that are really, uh, I think, the telling ones, and that's those small scales, the single dorsal fin, and the single pair of barbels. Juvenile tench can be a little bit more difficult to recognize, partly because we have those native minnows that are smaller, and so on the right side you see a, a probably about a one-year-old uh, tench, and still it has that uh, single uh, single dorsal dorsal meaning the back fin, the one on top, and uh, and a greenish color, very small scales. And on the left side are really uh, just hatched fish, like they're the young of the year, so they don't stay that small for very long. But I have captured a number of those, especially same thing. Um, and I tend to capture them at sites where we haven't seen the adults uh, for whatever reason. So sometimes they're a warning sign. Um, and they're fairly hard to distinguish, but um, they do have that characteristic black spot um, next to the tail. And it is a brown spot compared to, for example, that fish, which is a common carp, not a tench, that has more of a crescent-shaped spot. So um, you can, you know, I suppose if you come across a fish like that and suspect that it may be a tench, you can always uh, keep it and freeze it and report it. You can send uh, the voucher. Somebody will look at it. Um, so that is um, it for my presentation that I prepared for you today. And I would just like to recognize that I did not do the work alone. I had a million field assistants and a lot of help from my lab mates, uh, but also uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada funded my research. And a lot of the information I got uh, was from the provinces of Quebec and Ontario, um, who included me in um, information sharing about the fishes as they were being detention as they were being captured and also my work in Vermont was really facilitated by uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife and uh, Ellen Marsden uh, University of Vermont who allowed us to work in the Ruben Slaney Consistent Science Laboratory uh, we couldn't have done all the work in Lake Champlain without her so um, thank you for listening, and uh, you can always contact me if you have any other questions after the webinar. My email address is up there, and I would love to take any of your questions. Thank you, Sunchi. That was amazing. Um, really great presentation. We have some time for questions. So the first one we have is, everyone must be wondering, what happened with the farmer? Oh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Nothing in the end. I think the province of Quebec was, uh, they had wanted to prosecute him at first, and there was some court stuff, but then it was dropped. And uh, the one thing they did is they poisoned all of his ponds because I think he was also keeping common carp in there and some crayfish. He had a bunch of ideas for enterprises. Um, so they, they did put rotenone, uh, which is a poison that kills fish, in all of his ponds. Um, so uh, there are no longer um, fish in there, as far as we know, but yeah, he was not prosecuted in the end. Okay, uh, the next question is, can we eat tench? Uh, so it's possible to eat tench, and I suppose if you're catching them angling and you eat it, uh, that's fine. If, if you look up how to prepare it, um, as, as I mentioned, there are people in restaurants in Italy where it's a specialty. Um, I have to admit, I tried it when I was on vacation and it was quite good. Um, I think it depends on the habitat it lives in. Also, if it's in a really muddy habitat, it's gonna taste muddy. Some people complain there's a lot of bones. Um, but one of the things I would warn against is creating kind of an industry around uh, tench. So like any kind of ideas about creating you know, kind of a commercial enterprise around catching these tench that are here now uh, tends to usually undermine management efforts because then you have um, an industry whose interest is to keep uh, the supply of tench high so that we end up managing uh, for increased tench availability. I mean, I don't really think that um, 
there's a big demand for attention. I don't know if one could create one anyways, but it, it's always a dangerous slippery slope uh, when we start thinking about creating um, like just basically a commercial fishery out of innovator. Okay, um, the next question is, have you aged your samples? What structures are you using to age them? Okay, so I have not aged my samples, but I, I sent all of those to uh, Fisheries and Oceans uh, uh, Quebec, and they're doing a big aging uh, and population analysis, and they're using otoliths to age them. Um, they're, yeah. Yeah, sorry, that was the end of my answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay. Um, you mentioned telemetry studies regarding tench. Are there acoustically tagged fish in the Great Lakes Basin? Uh, so there are in um, the, there have been hundreds of fish that were tagged uh, by DFO Quebec over the past uh, three years, I think. Uh, so there were fish that were tagged mostly in Lake Saint Pierre. Um, because that's where they were able to catch a lot of fish, also some areas around Montreal. And if those fish are moving uh, towards the Great Lakes, we should be able to detect that. Okay, um, is there evidence of tench eating freshwater mussels? There is at least one. I have at least one tench from my samples where um, there was a freshwater mussel. There was a unit mussel. Um, possibly we're not finding more um, because they get the unionated muscles get larger and also they're not quite as abundant anymore unfortunately since the zebra mussel invasion. Um, the next question is, the person said, thank you for this. I live in Leamington, Ontario. It seems to me like Lake St. Clair would provide great habitat for tench. I'm wondering if there's any monitoring going on here at the western end of Lake Erie and Lake St. Clair. I don't think there is any targeted monitoring that is happening yet. I agree Lake Erie possibly has even better habitat than Lake Ontario. Bay of Quinty will have nice habitat, but Lake Erie with those kind of shallower waters um, and wetland areas, I agree, and Lake St. Clair will have really good habitat. And I think the reason they're not being targeted at this point is just because it feels like they're really far still. Um, they're still on the other side of Lake Ontario, and I, I think a lot of people were skeptical the tench would even arrive in as far as Great uh, Lake Ontario. Um, so I think it's still a little bit off the radar uh, for targeted monitoring efforts. Um, I mean, there are other, uh, there is other just regular monitoring of the fish communities, um, but and they haven't, of course, detected uh, tench. But there are no targeting efforts, and maybe there should be, maybe with eDNA or something. Okay, uh, the next question is Are we anticipating to have this species listed in the near future under the AIS regs? Yes, I hope so, uh, because it has been, uh, there has, have been a lot more discussions um, with. Um, the uh, Ontario Ministry um, in terms of listing it. I I now don't remember whether they were, had been listed um, federally. I thought they were. Um, I know for sure they had not been listed under Ontario, and I think that they likely will be uh, after uh, their arrival, not when they have plenty. Uh, the next question is, what gear are tench most susceptible to being caught? We often fish in shallow nearshore areas in Lake Erie with large mesh trammel nets. Do you think this is an acceptable gear to capture tench? Yeah, I think so. For sure, for uh, adults, you, you would capture them in there, um, especially if it's nearshore wetland areas. Uh, we've had a bit of a uh, we were trying to figure out this past summer, our lab in collaboration with Fisheries and Oceans, we were targeting tench and um, we needed them for experiments and we were trying to figure out what the best gear was. And um, we just found that it, it's a little bit of luck. I mean, we had really good luck sometimes with bike nets. Uh, sometimes we had really good luck uh, with electrofishing. Um, 
so I, I I can't say that there's like one like best uh, method. Certainly with electrofishing, uh, they have been catching a lot of adults in areas where the nets have been catching fewer. Um, but I think the trimmel nets would be good uh, as part of a monitoring program. Okay, uh, the next question is, is there a relationship between tench and European water chestnut? Oh, I am not sure. Um, I, I, I don't know of a study that has found a correlation specifically between the two. Um, anecdotally, there was a site um, that was really dense with water chestnut where I captured tench. I imagine that dense uh, vegetation where tench can find uh, shelter from predators um, would be really good habitat for tench. But I, I don't know of a specific study that says that it's better than other uh, vegetation. Okay, uh, the next question, is it possible to predict when tench spawn? And is it possible to target spawning adults? Uh, it's, so we do know that tench start to spawn when temperature goes above 18 degrees. So they won't be spawning really early in the spring. Um, I suppose one could target spawning adults. They do spawn multiple times a season, though, as long as the temperature stays above uh, 20 degrees, 18, 20 degrees. So um, it may be difficult to capture every spawning event or predict um, exactly uh, times when they'll be spawning. Um, it, it's probably pretty easy to like capture that first one when they. Uh, begin to spawn, but I, I don't know if we could predict um, exactly like uh, every single spawning event throughout the season. The next question is, have you checked citizen science apps like iNaturalist to get a sense of more locations where tench are present? Yes, I have, and actually I think those are really good. Um, I think there were, uh, I didn't check them before I produced that map, which was uh, produced a few years ago for a publication, but um, recently I have been looking at it and there are a number of tributaries uh, of the St. Lawrence that I had not been aware of uh, where tench have been reported on iNaturalist. The next question is, are there any efforts towards catching tench larvae? I don't think so, not that I know. I think that the the plans that the government has discussed so far involve targeting those large adult adults um, to try to. Uh, this has not been enacted in any way. They're still uh, pursuing whether this is a feasible effort. Um, but what has been discussed is reducing the abundance of the of adults at those really dense sites. Uh, there hasn't been any talk of. Uh, larvae. Okay, um, the next, it's not a question, it's just a note um, to kind of add to the monitoring question we had earlier. Um, this person wanted us to know that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is targeting invasive species with a variety of sampling gears in near shore waters of Lake Erie, uh, fike nets, electrofishing, and other gears that could collect tench. And this is in areas including Lake Huron, uh, Lake Ontario, or the, sorry, the Huron Erie Waterway, uh, Lake Ontario, Lake Huron and at select areas across the Great Lakes. Um, so that's just something to, to add on to that. And uh, our next question is, how do you address the concern regarding tagging and re-releasing re invasive tench back into the environment rather than removing and euthanizing the individuals? Um, I, I think what's currently happening in Quebec is that there isn't really a legislation that says that they need to remove them. So unfortunately, what's currently happening is that those commercial fishers that are catching thousands of tench um, in Lake St. Pierre often will just, uh, and certainly I know that that's happening in the Richelieu River, um, will, when they get a net full of tench, they will just dump it back in the river. Um, so that is probably a bigger concern uh, than the few hundred fish that they tagged. Um, and I think that the benefits of knowing how far those fish are moving and how they're moving um, probably are worth, uh, you know, uh, 
not euthanizing those couple hundred fish um, with the goal and goal being that um, if they determine that it's going to be useful that they will then move on to uh, plans to like target large numbers of tension and remove them um, yeah so I think that there are already many tench that are being captured and then re-released um, like in greater numbers than the uh, one study Okay, uh, the next question is, is there any evidence that the tench have relationships with other invasive species? So, for example, do tench do well in areas with Eurasian water milfoil, or have zebra mussel populations decreased in areas with tench? Right, so uh, we have not seen, uh, like, we have not seen a big decrease yet. Um, for example, in zebra mussels, it would be really hard to study. Um, right now because they're just not as abundant in the areas of the St. Lawrence where there are a lot of zebra mussels. I think that that's certainly something that one would be able to tell in, as the invasion um, moves onwards, um, like a few years down the line. Um, I have some preliminary data that I haven't uh, analyzed that I hope to uh, have at least a preliminary answer to that question for the Richelieu and maybe like St. Pierre. Uh, but I think at this point uh, in the invasion, we probably can't know for sure. Um, certainly, they do seem to be eating a lot of zebra mussels. Um, they do have a larger gape size than, like, their mouth is bigger uh, than uh, rat and goby, at least for the larger individuals. So maybe they will eat some of the larger zebra mussels that they have rat and goby can't. Um, and just, but uh, we don't know um, at this point. And, um, uh, and yeah, again, about uh, the association with uh, Eurasian water mouth oil, we don't know yet. I really, I, I do have, uh, I have collected data uh, about that from the surveys we did in um, the St. Lawrence and Lake Champlain, and I really hope to have that analyzed and have an answer for you uh, soon. Like, I hope to get that publication out within the year. So uh, I can't answer that right now, but I hope to be able to answer that uh, very soon. Uh, the next question is, are there any non-native or native species within the Great Lakes that Tench can hybridize with? I don't think there are. Is I, I haven't um, read anything about Tench hybridizing with anything else in, across the invaded range, and I don't think there is anything. I'm like, I'm not 100% sure, but I, I don't think there is anything it'll hybridize with. Okay, um, so that looks like all the questions we have. Um, if anyone has any, again, Sunji's contact information is right here, or you can send me an email and I can put you in touch with her. Um, so again, thank you so much, Sunji, for speaking at today. That was a really great presentation. I'm sure everyone learned a lot about Tench. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. This webinar was recorded, and it will be posted on our website, uh, www.asiancarp.ca, which you can find here uh, in the next day or so. Uh, again, just to remind you guys, there is a very short survey following this webinar, so if you could take a couple seconds to fill it out, we'd really appreciate it. So thanks again, everyone, uh, for listening, and stay tuned for some future webinars. And thank you, Soonchi. Yeah, thank you.